All right, so I want to call a uh, good evening, everyone. So welcome to the third session of Global Teacher Conversation. So I was asking just now to type in the chat one new thing that you have learned in this past two weeks. Well, Jensen have shared uh, he learned about um, creating uh, questions for assessment. What about you guys? If you can share, then you can perhaps you can share in the chat one new thing that you have learned in these two weeks. Right. So welcome to Global Teacher Conversation. Today, we also joined by our experts from the industry. We have our second industry crossover session today. A little bit of a Zoom norms here. You can mute when you're not speaking. Um, this is so that sounds will not be clashing. But um, most of the time, I'll probably ask you to unmute anyway, so that we can have a direct conversation with each other. Uh, be present, switch on your video if possible, although we're online, but it will be good to see your faces while talking and participate actively. Don't be shy. Don't worry about your English. Nobody's here going to correct your grammar or anything for that. Uh, we're just using English just for the sake of having that one similar language to interact with each other. Okay. All right. Um, every week, we need to emphasize uh, uh, and put emphasis on the GTC pillar principles. So the three pillar principles are respectful, supportive, and participative. All of us are respectful in the way that we're mindful of how we speak, how we behave, and how we communicate with each other. And we are also supportive because we give space and time for our conversation partners. Uh, we don't cut through uh, their sentences, and we make sure that they feel supported, right? So how you show support for your partners, you show interest, you ask questions, and you can also answer questions that are directed to you. I see some people put in the chat. So Ruby said, uh, I went for a research course and learned new way to conduct action research. Mm, action research has been on the rise for Malaysian teachers like this past few years. Good, good, good. So Loen, that um one new thing she learned this past two weeks is some ideas to organize warm-up activities in peace mm. so you guys can also ask her later what is what does she mean by warm-up activities but in peace right okay cool cool anyone want to share their one thing that they learned in the past two weeks you can put in the chat right a little bit of an agenda here. Just this is just rough agenda. Uh, we will start now, and in about um eight twenty or eight twenty five, we'll do industry crossover. There's a plenary sharing by Dr. Terry Gandhi Go and friends. Um, and then we'll have open Q and A. We have a sharing space, and then we'll have a conversation with this um people. And then we'll close with some announcement, photo time, and closing. Okay. All right. So I do want to talk tonight about dangers of our world today. What do I mean by dangers of our world? Right? What are some changes in the world you see happening today? Hint, hint, weather. Anyone can say? Anyone can guess what I meant? by changes in the world, the heat weather. You can unmute and tell me, what do you think I meant by this one? Hmm. Why is everyone staring at the screen now? <laughs> <laughs> is it climate change? Climate change, yes. Hmm. Thank you, soft one. Okay, you see this picture? So what I meant is by the rising temperature, right? I remember the past few weeks, it was so hot that the temperatures are rising. 
So what happened when the temperature rises? Anyone want to anyone want to share what they know when weather becomes so hot? Maybe Terry, Safwan, and Amiro. Maybe you guys can <laughs> not answer this round. Come on, did you see members? Divya, Tan, and I'm calling all of you. <laughs> Luan, Ruby, Jinsan. It affects the plants and also the humans. Mm -hmm. It affects the plant just because you see the picture that I share, right? <laughs> and also us. It also us. How? How does it affect the plants and us? Your everything is just a ruby. Come on. <laughs> How does the hot weather affect the plants and us? Uh, I think the temperature uh, rate is make the um level of what uh sea level of sea water will hide and I live in the Mekong Delta now so uh. At least in the very dangerous place in the world, will disappear in the future with the temperature high. Right. True, 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 true. So, because it's too hot, the, the icebergs, glaciers will melt. And when the glaciers and ice will melt over there, the sea level will rise. Correct, Lord. Uh. What I want to say actually was about plants. When it's too hot, plants cannot survive. So plants cannot survive because of many things, because it's too hot and also because of hot because of the hot weather, that we're also exposed to drought, right? When drought happen, there's no water. So the plants will be in competition with us and animals to get water. You know who will get water first? Of course, human and animals. But plants will get water last, you see? So what happened next is shortage of food, what we call a food crisis. There's a lot more discussion about food crisis, but this is one of it that will happen. All right, next one. Hint, P, first letter P, Last letter N, what is it? I want to hear from Tan, from Luan, from Jin San, and, and you don't keep quiet, huh? And can I guess? No. Yeah, I can, but Ruby, you can popcorn to someone else since you already tried this now. Okay, can. Wait, let me you can make you. someone else guess this time. Okay, um, who is Tan? Tan. <laughs> Tan. Ruby has called you. You can unmute. Do you know what this word is, Tan? Oh, pollution. Pollution, correct. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, if you look if you look at the photo, what kind of pollution do you think it is? Mm, I see a river, they keep on uh I mean they could keep on uh throw the rubbish into the river and mm -hmm. and then uh the creatures in the river cannot survive. Mm, so what kind of pollution is that? Uh water pollution. All right, correct. Water pollution. What else? Um, besides water pollution, what other pollution that you do? I think you have the what called uh, air pollution. Yes, correct. We have air pollution, correct. Right. right. So Tan has given us an example where when we throw rubbish into the river, so it uh pollute the water, right? And it affects the animals in the water. And Jinsan also has mentioned pollution. So this photo here is actually a photo about 
uh, illegal waste dumping into the river. So uh, we say we're going into the modern phase of our life. We have so many factories. We go into. We always talk about um, industrial revolution 4.0, but there is also a consequence where this modernization also can lead to pollutions, right? Right. Next, the more we use, the lesser it becomes. But it is. What do you think it is? The more we use stuff, the lesser this. Then you can call someone else. Terry? Uh, not Terry. <laughs> hmm. Amiru? Mm, not Amiru. Not Amiru. Okay. Uh, Jinsan. Maybe Jinsan. Jinsan? Yes. Do you, think, do you know what this is? Um, three? Three. Hmm. Okay. I'll give a photo. What is this? Uh, is it plastic or is it clean water? This is a landfill. Oh, okay. Yeah, we call it a landfill. So the more we use stuff, the lesser the space in the landfill. Mm. So yeah, so it's it's not only a matter of whether we recycle anymore. Maybe we should ask the questions: Are we consuming more than we should today? Are we eating more than we should today? Right? Okay. I want I want all of you guys to maybe think about this for a bit. Uh, can you name some of endangered animals, perhaps in Malaysia? You guys can put in the chat or you can unmute. We have tapir, we have a panda, we have tiger. Mm, good guess, good guess. Okay, what is this? <laughs> what is this? Hornbill. Hornbill, correct. Okay, what's the next one? Elephant. What is this? Elephant. Uh, it's a Borneo pygmy elephant. This one is spotted in Kedah. Right, I see in the chat also. Okay, Tan said sun bear. Yeah, sun bear is correct as well. Right, one more photo. Ah, what is this? Isn't this tapir? No? Yes, yes, this is a tapir. Why the color is <laughs> <laughs> so it's a different tapir than the one that we are used to, right? Okay. So uh Loen, uh is there any endangered animals over there in Vietnam? Mm. Yes, but I can remember now. <laughs> yeah, I can call them. I can call them. Okay, okay, okay. But I have in intro now. I see. Okay, okay. Mm. You can find out. You can try to find out what are endangered animals over there in Vietnam and share with us. Okay. All right. So, um, tonight, why why am I opening the session with, do you know, uh, environmental issues in the world? Um, do you know about endangered wildlife that we have here in Malaysia? Because this is uh, related to uh, our guest tonight. 
And our guests tonight are Dr. Kari Jazi Go and Sofwan Badruddin and also Amiru Zahir. So these three gentlemen here are conservationists. So you have read about me mentioning this phrase in your emails and also tonight, but what is exactly a conservationist, right? So con conservationist is a person who advocates or acts for the protection and preservation of environment um, and the wildlife. However, to give a more nuanced elaboration of what exactly conservationists do, I think it's best that we invite the Terry and friends to share what is it that they do, or what interesting thing that they explore as a conservationist, and what they've learned over the course of their journey as a conservationist. I will stop sharing here so that the Terry and friends can share. Terry, you ready? Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, what we can do right now is maybe Amiru and Safwan, can you just like give an introduction for yourself while I open my slides and all that? You first, Safwan. <laughs> Malu. Uh. Hey, you Malu. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, so my name is Safwan with the Uh do I need to switch on my, my camera or not? Oh, we appreciate it if you uh, open your camera so that we can okay. actually see who we're talking yeah. to. Okay, so it's going to be a bit dim because I'm currently doing a light trapping at Mount Kiara. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can see me or not. So, um, so my name is Sofan Madruddin. I'm, I'm from University of Malaya before in, for my undergraduate years. And then after that, um, I continue working. That's why I met uh, Dr. Terry. And then after that, I'm working with uh, Henry Barlow on his private moth collection and butterflies collection for about four years. And then continue for my master's in Imperial College London uh, for a year. And then coming back, working back with Henry Barlow. Uh, and now I'm just uh, waiting to see if I can do my PhD or not. Um, just for hoping to do a PhD afterwards. Okay, uh, Amiru, can you go next? Okay, sorry, I won't be <laughs> I won't be opening my camera. Uh so my name is Amiro and like you see on the screen, I consider myself as a self-thought naturalist. I'm I'm currently following a diploma in horticulture in Polytechnic Nilai. And I'm also <clears throat> I'm also a junior employee over here with Soft One. Uh, in arranging some entomological boxes and currently I'm doing some herbarium stitchings. So all of this will help you my experience in the whole natural history journey. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm next. Uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Terry Gaziko. Uh, I have a PhD in ecology. Um, and I'll be doing the slideshow today, uh, the plenary talk on uh, what do naturalists do. And uh, I'm, I'm aware that right now we're talking to teachers. So I try to like, you know, arrange it as much as possible to like an education theme. So yeah, just a brief introduction of the speakers uh, is me, uh, Dr. Terry, uh, Safwan, and Amirul. So uh, I kind of chose like, um, how to say, of three different levels of experience right now. So I'm more of a mid-level um, career in terms of conservation. Safwan is early career. I mean, he just, he's finished his master's. He's almost, he's going into his PhD. And Amiro's just at that start of the journey. So uh, I want to try to like have a bit more of like a range of uh, experience within um, co the conservation field. So um, I think what I want to talk about first is something called taxonomy. Uh, I think I heard you guys use the word uh, just now about for your education stuff, but in terms of about in terms of biology, that's just a very different meaning. And one thing about uh, the work that 
you know, me software that Amir will do is that it actually has a lot to do with taxonomy. And taxonomy is a very important part about conservation. So what is taxonomy? Uh, it's very important to understand that uh, taxonomy isn't taxidermy. Those are two very different things, okay? Um, taxonomy comes from the word taxos, which means to put into order, and nomos, which means nomia, which means method. So it's a method of arranging things. And uh, in terms of biologically arranging things, what we try to do is we try to properly, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to properly identify and properly place things within um, a classification. So when it comes to a lot of conservation work, like what you were just doing just now with the elephants, the, the hornbills and all that, um, we also have to do this, a similar thing as biologists, but it's a whole lot more complicated uh, you know, there's like almost 30 plus species of hornbill on in the peninsula. No, 20 something species of hornbill, sorry. So, um, you know, it is quite difficult. You have to be trained to do all these kind of things. So uh, we're going to be talking a bit about this. So uh, if you know your biology, you can uh, see that we kind of have different order, we have different classifications. You start with kingdoms and then you kind of like drill down until you find the species. Uh, a lot of times we have to actually catalog all these species. For example, this is a preserved beetle over here. Oops. So this over here is a preserved beetle. Uh, and this is what Amirul was talking about. This is called a herbarium sheet. A herbarium sheet is basically um, a dried up plant, which we use as a reference uh, material for like botanical collections. It's the same with preserved insects as well. A lot of what we have to deal with is actually preserved uh, organisms because you can't look at all their characteristics just based on like a photograph or, you know, just like field observation. So what exactly is taxonomy? Um, well, if you go, if you actually look at the Bible, uh, according to the Bible, taxonomy is the oldest profession. Um, yeah, it's not prostitution, it is taxonomy. So why does that, why is that? Uh, because if you actually read Genesis, uh, it is said that the original task of humans was to classify and give names to the beasts, the animals, and everything else. So as you can see, the roots of taxonomy actually go very, very far, especially philosophically. Um, when you think about it, the, the need to tell apart species is very, very important. Uh, even when you look at how cavemen used to draw on caves, they were making a lot of very important notes on how to define certain species, animals that they hunted, because these are like life and death uh, situations. A good identification could save your life. You could have the right medicine, you could hunt the right animals. And these are all really, really important skills to have for being human. So uh, in terms of identifying species, this is actually a skill that has a very, very long history. And only uh, while scientists do it, scientists do a very formal version of it. So to give um, a very simple example here, uh, can you tell what's on the right and what's on the left? Anyone? Anyone want to try? Okay, you guys can just unmute and answer, yeah? So like uh, the example that was given just now, uh, when we talk uh, to like the lay person, usually they'll ask about things like, oh, okay, you, so your job is to like tell the tiger apart from the leopard. But um, the truth is, it's actually very different um, for a biologist. If you're working in conservation, uh, 
So if you look at this pie chart, you see like vertebrates are like this tiny slice here. Actually, most animals are not vertebrates. Um, you know, when you like show pictures of tapirs and all that, that is like less than 1% of living things. Uh, the truth is a majority of living things are not vertebrates. They're not even mammals. Uh, they are usually things like plants, insects. In fact, insects make up a majority of life. And um, like me and Safwan, we study insect uh, taxonomy. So it's our expertise to actually identify and uh, be able to know what, the insects, what insects are there, like what he's currently doing now. He's trapping moths somewhere in KL. So, uh, so we just want you to be aware that actually uh, a lot of the study of life deals with things that you don't even think about. And some of the most endangered animals are the ones that really we don't even, we have not even properly identified and properly recorded. So, yeah, if you talk about conservation, actually you're looking at something more like this. You're looking at a lot of small animals. You're looking at invertebrates. You're looking at uh, ecosystems like forests. And once you get really deep into taxonomy, it becomes basically um, extreme spot the difference. So just now, my example was just like a tiger, right? But once you get deeper and deeper into that, uh, this field, you actually have to like start remembering like things such as anatomy. You have to like, understand the morphology of the animal. You have to be able to use certain words to describe the animal. So you need to like widen your vocabulary. Uh, you have to look through a lot of specimens. So this is, I used to work at a museum. Uh, we have this, Museums of Natural History here. And a lot of these are research collections. So you have to like go through it, you have to look through it, and you have to understand what exactly is the, you know, you have to look at a drawer like this and try to identify all the species in it. Or as I said just now, uh, preserved specimens are very, very important. These are our reference collections to be able to identify living animals. So Usually, in terms of training, we are trained on, a lot, on identifying a lot of these uh, preserved collections. Some of them are quite old already. Yeah? They come from like the 1960s, 1970s. Some are pre-independence. Um, also, you can see some specimens here. Sometimes we keep them in alcohol. Sometimes we, you can see that we have to keep ledgers of them. We have to record all of them. It's really, really a time-consuming process, and there's not enough people doing it. So just now I had a picture of like a tiger and a leopard. That was the easy one. Uh, can you tell the difference between these two th beetles? Anybody want to try? <laughs> you know, just give me like one example of what, what is different. Um, the one on the left has um, darker, darker hands and legs. The legs are darker in color uh, compared okay. to the one on the right. Okay, yeah, so there's a slight difference in coloration. Um, I could be looking at the hairiness of it. One is hairier, the left one is hairier than the other. If you like notice all the hairs on it. Um, I could be looking at the texture of it. You see the one on the right is smoother than the one on the left. Um, so all these like really tiny details are something that uh, a taxonomist or conservationist has to look through. Um, and there are not a lot of us who can actually do it. Uh, I think, uh, so these are dung beetles. And even like within Malaysia, I don't think there's, I think there's maybe like two or three active dung beetle researchers at the moment. And like for this group alone, there's like a hundred species in it. So like you have to, be able to tell apart like all these tiny, like 10 millimeter long beetles. Um, and it's not an easy job. And a lot of them, we don't even know what, uh, what their ecology is. We don't know what their lifestyle is. So uh, you know, 
in terms of conservation, there's like just so much that we're losing so fast and we don't have enough people to actually deal with this loss. But this is an even harder one. Can you tell the difference between these two flies? So uh, I'll just give you the answer to this. So if you see this one, is like, it's got two hairs here. Well, this one has like one hair here, one hair here. And so it's got three hairs instead of two hairs. And you know, that's how you tell the difference between these two species. <laughs> so as you can see, a uh, biologist's job is sometimes very, very difficult. Um, but that's how we actually go about uh, these kind of things. Uh, so training is actually very, very important. Uh, this is something that is more recent. So what I've been showing you before this is what we call traditional taxonomy. So a lot going back into like a long time into the past, people used to only look at the physical characteristics of an animal. Uh, now we have some technology, people can take DNA and compare. So this is what we call DNA barcoding. So you record the DNA of an animal, and then you compare two things with DNA uh, sequences. So by comparing DNA sequences, you can see like the percentage of difference, and then you can make some judgments based on whether they are the same species or not. Um, usually, DNA barcoding tends to agree quite a lot with traditional taxonomy. So usually, we use both of them at the same time. So this is where I get into uh, the more education aspect of it. Um, one thing about, like when I tell you these things about, okay, you know, the beetle must have like different hairs and different texture and all that. Um, it's very difficult to actually learn all of this from books. So the way that we actually train people in, uh, in this subfield of taxonomy is actually through a master and apprentice really, uh, method. So instead of, you know, you are given a course assignment and then you must answer the questions correctly, you actually have to study under somebody. Uh, so that is the method that we use for training. Uh, and so this kind of method uh, actually it dates back to pre-industrial times. Uh, so when you look at old university traditions, uh, the way that people thought was that they had to go and work under somebody and learn from that person. Uh, even once you get to a, like a modern PhD level, uh, what is important is actually going under somebody and learning, uh, you know, you learn from your supervisor. So that is kind of um, the way that we are taught. Uh, and I guess most of you are like high school teachers. And I have done some teaching in like a high school setting and I feel I mean, like it's like so different because, um, you know, for your level, you have to be very general. You have to be very generalist. And your goal is to create somebody who has, you know, potential and a lot of general, uh, a lot of generality. Whereas um, when we try to train our people, we have to try to train them to be specialists. And, we give them like a very narrow skill set, but we make them, we try to train them up to be good in that narrow skill set. Okay, so moving on to conservation. Uh, how, well, how, how formal do we have to be in this? <laughs> okay, I, I'm just going to just go on with it. Anyway, so moving on to conservation. If I was to talk about the field of conservation from my current perspective, this is what's going on. Um, it's really, really bad all over the world. Uh, everything's on fire. Everything is burning. Uh, the people in charge do not have your um, best interest in mind. And yeah, yeah, just generally, it's all bad news. But uh, I want to just cover a small amount of the bad news. I don't want this to like start off as too much of a downer. Uh, so just now we are talking about like how within my field we study insects a lot. Uh, have any of you heard of the insect apocalypse? 
Yeah, so this is like very poorly known, but people have been like recording, people like me have been like recording insects for like decades. Someone over there has like years and years worth of data from just like one locality. And what we've noticed is that they're all disappearing. Uh, they just like disappearing. And you see, when that happens, uh, that's a canary in the coal mine situation. Uh, when insects disappear, basically our pollinators disappear, our food systems start breaking down, our soil starts breaking down, and life on Earth basically comes to, uh, it, it faces its like, most major threat. And we're not talking about this, and everyone is just like, you know, going around happily, uh, living consumerist lifestyles, going on holidays, and... Yeah, what can I say? You know, doom is coming. <laughs> so, best case scenario um, is kind of this. Um, you know, the house is already burnt down. Hopefully, we can put the fire out eventually. But uh, I'm honestly not positive about the future. So, um, yeah, this is kind of a bit of an introduction to like. Um, the viewpoints of a conservationist. Uh, I'm sorry, there are not many like cute animal photos, but uh, yeah, you know, it's it's not all good news right now. <laughs> okay, so um, should I pass it back to the floor? Yeah, thank you, Terry. Um, I want to pose a challenge for our LGTC members here. Uh, let's ask one question each, at least, to Dr. Terry and friends. Okay. So you can post your question to either Dr. Terry or Amirol or Sohoy. You can unmute your mic and just... So we understood that it's not all um, good stuff happening right now with the insect apocalypse at all. Uh, but we do we we we've heard your frustration, <laughs> but we do want to hear. Um, and we talk about this a lot of time in GTC about uh, finding and refinding. Really Forward, right? So, um, I want to ask like someone and maybe uh, Amiro, right? Um, what motivates you to stay like, researching um, all these insects and, and do conservation works like this? Do you want to go first, Amira? Do you want to go first, Amira? Let's see what drives what still drives me in conservation. So, so basically, conservation is science with a duty. Um, extinction can happen anytime. Anything can go extinct. So, what motivates me is that. <laughs> Honestly, the hero complex of it, like you're preserving the species. So, for example, I'm more into plants. So, I collect and also um, propagate endangered plants like timber trees and some other vascular plants like begonias and everything. And just having that, like, you know, knowing that you can make some small minor projects, like, oh, you can replant it somewhere else and everything. Yeah, that motivates me. So, thank you, Alicia, next. Um, yes, for my part in conservation, well, I didn't do much in conservation, but yet on the ball. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, so, but the first is just taxonomy, uh, just collecting moths and looking at butterflies and all that. But then at some point, you realize that when you collect all of things, 
it's going to decrease and decrease and decrease every year. And you see it, it's trending in declining trend. And then you realize that conservation needs to be done. But when you realize it, it's actually too late. Um, as that you said with the pictures just now, it's a we all <laughs> we all doomed because of that. <laughs> but what we can do is just first we need to know, for me at least, uh, before doing any conservation works, I need to know what species or what group is actually the most threatened group for all of it before I can do anything with, with the conservations. Once you pinpoint the, um, the species, the group, then you can start to do conservation works and all that. Uh, one of the things that you can do about conservation is just, you see tigers and all that. So they've got a lot of these uh, subspecies. Some people say such species actually doesn't exist. And they, are, they, make, they make argument that if such species exist, human also needs such species for each and every other race. So like Malay, maybe Malayanus. Chinese, maybe Chinese, uh, Chinese seas or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's important in conservation to make subspecies level because that's going to make like this country proud because they have this, like Malaysia, we got some, what is Matrana? I know we got some tigers. What for? I can't remember the day. Is it Jacob C? I can't remember anymore. But yeah, Jacksony. Jacksony, Jacksony. <laughs> So yeah, for each and every, when you make that subspecies, even though you just introduce, it's a very controversial thing to say, but you just, when you introduce that, people are going to say, oh, oh we have this subspecies in our country. So that are going to uh, encourage people to take care more on, on, that, on that part. So yeah, uh, yes, uh, that's all I'm about to say. I mean, yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just need to create something for people to take care of it. To, to make people concerned about it, not just, but, oh, that's a moth. I don't know what species it is, but that's the moth. The, <laughs> yeah, so. You need to make like a some story of it, like how this moth comes to be extinct, how many more left, estimation and all that, so people can oh, uh, em sympathize or empathy with it, empathize with it. So it's going to make conservation works uh, not, not, not easier, but at least, people will start to concern and start to realize that actually we need to look after, after a lot of things. Even for snails, actually, not just small. Snails also included. Thank you, um, Hi, do you, uh, do you want to add I, something else? Yeah, sure. Can I just, uh, just answer the questions in the chat? I think there are quite a number of them right now. Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, okay. Maybe... Um, because chat wouldn't be recorded uh, in the video. Okay, can just, I, I'll just read it out then? Uh, sure. Okay, so the first question is, how do you draw the students' interest about insects, uh, especially those that are anti-insect? Um, well, you see, insects are a very, very large group. Um, and I think the best way to like get children interested in like them, in insects is uh, focus on like, you can just start them out with like very charismatic species. So things like butterflies, bees, uh, you know, they, they look kind of cute. They, they are very useful to humans. That's when you start them up with that. You don't like tell them, okay, you must love all cockroaches kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you start them with things which are friendly looking, very uh, colorful, and then you, it goes from there. So uh, I think in a lot of, Especially, there's a lot of information now available of pollinators. So, uh, you know, if you want to get your students interested, maybe you could like ask them to look at butterflies. Uh, you know, just like see what, how many types of butterflies can you find in your garden, that kind of thing. Um, okay, I'll just go on to the next question. Uh, are the preserved animals dangerous? Uh, it depends. Uh, some it depends on the method of preservation. So some methods of preservation do not use a lot of uh, dangerous chemicals. Like for insects, we just dry them up and they're usually just fine. Um, others like fish, uh, frogs, reptiles, we, we have to use some dangerous chemicals to preserve them, like formaldehyde and all that. So um, yeah, you wouldn't want to like touch those with your bare hands. You would like just use a forceps or a glove or something. Okay, uh, moving on. What are some reasons for insect species declination? Um, various reasons. Um, 
in Malaysia, a very big reason is uh, habitat destruction. So we're destroying a lot of forest and we're replacing it with just oil palm. So oil palm is just one plant, whereas a forest has like hundreds of plants. So when you have, you go from like 100 to one, then you are losing so much uh, potential habitat for animals, especially insects, because insects usually are very specific to plants. Um, other reasons are pesticide use. We use way too much pesticide in Malaysia. Uh, and we've known since like the early 2000s that we use too much pesticides, but it is uncontrolled. People just ignore it. Uh, you know, when you do fogging in Malaysia, fogging doesn't work anymore. You're just wasting your time. The mosquitoes are already immune to the fogging. In fact, uh, studies right now show that if you fog, you're actually increasing the population of mosquitoes. So uh, yeah, all these kind of things, like the science just hasn't gotten to the public. And um, oh, light pollution is also a problem for insects. We got like too much light. We um, put too much light in too many places and were very wasteful with our light. So a lot of insects are just like flying to spotlights and just dying. Mm. So yeah, we, there's so many reasons actually. Okay, uh, I'll move on to the next one um, that says, uh, is it mean we can't develop the forest? Yes, don't develop the forest. <laughs> no, let, let me rephrase that. You are not developing the forest, you're destroying the forest. So um, in conservation, we have this concept called ecosystem functions. Uh, okay, like just now, Atika, when you were explaining like, uh, you know, plants and animals and humans are in competition with water and, you know, the, the plants are the ones that get it last. That, that's all wrong. That's, that's misinformation. <laughs> so in Malaysia, plants are what creates fresh water. If you have plants, a lot of trees, a lot of forests, that is a source of fresh water. Uh, plants have root systems. When it rains on, on trees, all that water doesn't just flush down and turn into a flash flood. It goes into their root systems and it's stored in the soil. And then it's released slowly as fresh water into our rivers where we can use it. So if you get rid of a forest, you are basically destroying your water system. And when people say you want to develop a forest, no, you're not developing a forest. What you are doing is that you're destroying your source of fresh water. <laughs> it's suicidal. <laughs> and yet we are doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's crazy. I can only laugh at it. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the, I think the last question in this is um, how can we inculcate to conserve insects and other animals among endangered species? Um, because society just perceives them as just pests or dangerous animals. Um, yeah, a lot of it has to do with education. Outreach is very, very important. Um, sometimes you just need to have a lot of like, you know, do some photography, get like photos of like cute insects or something like that. Um, on other things is sometimes you just have to teach people to protect the things that will protect the insects. So like I was saying just now, if you protect the forest, you protect most insects and you protect yourself. Um, yeah, so sometimes you don't need to just say, okay, you must protect the insects. You must, what you can do is say, okay, you need to have some sense of self-preservation and protect your forest because otherwise you're going to start killing people. <laughs> and you know, when the insects are gone, we are gone. <laughs> okay, any more questions? I think I got, I covered all the ones in the chat. All right, oh, that's very nice. That's why we need uh, Dr. Terry and friends here because they are the experts so they can tell us which facts are actually accurate and not, right? So it's really, really good to have them here tonight. So if you guys have any more questions, you can just unmute right away and ask. Or you can also drop one in the chat. Um, in the meantime, 
I want to share a video on climate education uh, by Ryan. So Ryan is our friend from Philippine, from the Philippines, and he will be talking about climate education. Yeah. I know that we're talking about uh, the white life just now. We're talking about uh, insects. We're talking about a lot of things, but um, basically we're talking about the environment. And it's, the all, it's all related. Right? Yes, it's all related. Okay. Thank you very much. So before we go to our breakout room together with our guest tonight, uh, let's just watch uh, a brief video by Ryan. Hi everyone, in this presentation, I'll be providing an overview of the climate crisis and how you as teachers can take action through climate education. I'm Ryan Bestre. I'm from the Philippines and I currently work as a climate consultant of the Asian Development Bank. I was also a 2013 teacher fellow of Teach for the Philippines where I taught mostly science to third graders. And speaking of science, let's review the greenhouse effect. So this is the sun, it hits the surface of the earth and some heat would bounce back, but some of it would be trapped because there's a thin layer of carbon dioxide around the earth, which traps the heat. But the problem is this layer is becoming thicker and so more heat is trapped, leading to global warming. The greenhouse gases come from different human activities, from the energy sector, especially if we rely on coal, from the industrial processes, when we manufacture all the stuff that we buy, from the agriculture sector, specifically intensive farming and the animal industry. It comes from landfills, from transportation, and all of these lead to an increase in greenhouse gases and they accumulate in the atmosphere, forming a sort of a blanket. Now imagine you're wrapped around a blanket so you would feel warmer, right? So that is the greenhouse effect. So it leads to global warming and climate change. This illustration came from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and it shows the global temperature change throughout the years and it, and it has been increasing. We are currently here. This is our reality and it, unfortunately, it is getting worse. And in fact, July 2023 is said to be the hottest month on record. Now, because of the increase of temperature, this is causing the melting of the ice caps, rising sea levels, and other climate impacts such as extreme weather conditions like typhoons and floods. This is a photo of Tacloban in the Philippines back in 2013, when it was hit by the strongest typhoon ever to hit, ever to make landfall, Typhoon Haiyan. So it led to lost lives, lost properties, lost livelihoods. This photo is of a lake in India, which experienced um, droughts and these are only a few of the climate impacts and young people the youth um, children our students they are very vulnerable to climate impacts and since they are exposed to all of these they're also experiencing a lot of climate anxiety so that's the bad news and it sounds like it's all doom and gloom, but I think it is very important for us to understand the causes and impacts of climate change because we cannot solve a problem we do not understand. But the good news is, I believe there is still hope. And this is where you come in as, as teachers, as educators. You have a role in firstly, helping raise awareness about the climate crisis, and secondly, giving the message of hope to your students that together we can actually do something, we can 
contribute to the solution. And as teachers, you can integrate the, the subject uh, of climate change in, into the curriculum, or you can also embrace the principles of climate action and environmentalism and sustainability. Let me provide you some ideas of activities that you can do in the classroom or in the school. Um, you can expose your students to nature. So maybe you can establish a vegetable garden or you can bring your students to a nearby park or a forest where they can reconnect to nature. And by doing so, they, they gain more appreciation to nature and hopefully they get motivated to care for it more. Storytelling is an effective way of engaging our students. So you can create stories and you can use drawings. Um, you can turn it into a comic book to make it more visual. We're in an age where a lot of young people are tech savvy, so we can take advantage of, advantage of that. We can ask them to come up with visual stories, so short videos, documentaries, maybe um, a podcast. And the topics can be about the environment, um, how they're impacted by climate change, um, climate action in the community, etc. We can use art and creativity to raise awareness. So this is a soil painting where they use soil as a, a medium for, for, for this painting. We can also use social media. This is the Party for the Planet social media campaign of Greenpeace last year, where it's actually a TikTok dance challenge. So they use dance and movement um, positive messaging to put forward their their call for climate justice. So this is an effective way of engaging more young people, especially those who may not be as familiar to the topic. The climate crisis is an urgent problem that we have to to address together. We need climate education and we need climate action now. Hi everyone in All right. Uh I think there's a lot uh, for you to actually think about what we have done over the course of our uh, journey as a teacher in school. Did we uh, do anything uh, in our part to educate our students? And firstly, of course, educate ourselves first, right? And what better way than to seek out for knowledge, okay? Right. Um, I will be sending you over to breakout rooms with our guests in a bit. Here are some question prompts that you can share and discuss together. Right, number one. From all the topics, from wildlife to environment to climate, what is your one, at least one key takeaway or learning today? That's number one. Number two, in your life, what are some things that might be challenging for you? To protect them, for, for example, right? Uh, oh, I want to do my part to protect the environment, but I'm too lazy to recycle. I'm that kind of person who don't sort their rubbish, for example. Just for example. And question number three. From three, as a person and educated, or as a person or educated, name some changes that you will try to make starting from today. I will give you guys around two minutes to craft your responses. Think about what you would say to your conversation partners in a bit. And then I will be sending you to your breakout rooms.
these prompts are also for our guests. Feel free to. Just one more minute. All right, all over the 15 minute breakout room. So let's say you have finished uh, sharing all these three points. You have other things that you guys want to talk about together. You also can, as usual. So I'll send you guys over to your breakout room. See you again in 15 minutes, yeah? All right, welcome back, welcome back. Let's wait for a few more to come back from their breakout rooms. Okay. Oh, welcome back, everyone. Hi, Kamal. How are you doing? Doing good. How about you? <laughs> oh. Good, good, oh. good, good. Cool, cool. Long time to say. All right. That's um that's our breakout room, guys. Right? Okay. So a little bit of an announcement. You can sign up for opportunities, yeah. So there's a uh, sharing space. You can share about your initiative, your classroom efforts, your classroom practices, about your school, your project, or even about some things about your life that's something like personal to you. Uh, you just want to practice your English, you can use this sharing space, okay? And there's also member takeover for session. You can take over the whole session or part of the session. You can do that. You can just reach out to me. And if you want to be part of the GTC MBBS Nepal Student Exchange Program, you can uh, scan the QR code or go get the info that at the... Uh, link that has been provided. You can reach out to me as well if you have further questions. So, um, as you can see, the opportunity to become facilitator for um, the activity to student programs with the Japanese school has closed. We have secured all our facilitators and we will have our program next week. That's exciting. All right, uh, you can update your details uh, on the profile form. If you haven't already, you can scan your QR code there. And share your reflection. I know some of us uh, love to write their reflection. So just remember to tag Global Teacher Conversation on Facebook if you, if you write your reflection on Facebook. Um, you can follow the page uh, on Facebook as well. All right, that's all for the time. Let's take photo with everyone here. Uh, I hope everyone can um, open your uh, oh, wow. video. All right. <laughs> Tough one, time, joy. Let's um, open our videos uh, for group photos. Uh, Ted, you ready? Everyone ready? Uh, okay. All right, everyone ready? Okay, just one. Go ahead. Okay, count on three. Okay, three, two, one, smile. All right, or oh, one more because Terry, Dr. Terry and Tan was not ready just now. Sure, one moment. Let me have another one. My, my connection is very bad. I keep getting disconnected. <laughs> It's okay, you're okay. on now. Quickly, yeah. quickly. Yeah. Everyone, show me your thumb or piece. Okay, and ready? Three, two, one. Oh. Okay, great. All right, yeah. cool. Thank you, everyone. All right. Okay, now that we're done with the time, um, our fourth dinner session will happen on 2nd September, Saturday night, same time. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to Dr. Terry, the soft one, and also to Amiral for spending time and invaluable information. 
uh, and also knowledge that they have shared with us all in Global Teacher Conversation. Let's give them a round of applause. I know they might not be able to hear it, but they can see our, our club. So thank you, thank you so much, guys, um, for participating and sharing this, this gems with this uh, group. A uh, humble group of educators. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, our friends from Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, and Nepal joining in tonight. And we're uh, really grateful to have you guys here. Thank you, Dr. Terry, uh, Sofwan, and uh, Amirul. Thank you so much. All right. Um, that's it, guys. See you on the 2nd of September. Good night. Bye-bye. Good bye night. Bye-bye.